Epigenetics. And uh, then if we have time, I want to talk about not actually two brains, but two hearts. So this is a little picture of the uh, place where I had the privilege of doing some research in the Marshall Islands. We, um, do you know that the Marshall Islands have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes? In 1950s, there were three people in all of the Marshall Islands with type 2 diabetes, and today it's almost 40%. So we were doing a research project using lifestyle to treat type 2 diabetes in the Marshall Islands. And I spent about three years there doing some research while I wasn't there all the time. I mean, we had a three-year project, $2 million. And the reason for this is because here's the uh, result of type 2 diabetes. As you can see on this chart, uh, you're looking at on the, non- the non-diabetic here is uh, the average risk of death from heart disease, uh, and stroke. But if you have diabetes that starts after age 45, it's about three to four times the, the risk of death from heart attack and stroke. If you start earlier in life, then it can be 14 to 30 times. So you can see how serious this is. By the way, do you know what's happening to the age of onset, the age of beginning of type 2 diabetes in the world, in Australia and around the world? It's getting lower and lower. It's happening in, even in, in school. Yeah, well, people, children are still in school. Now, this was the result uh, of the first 10 days in our first treatment group. So this is a chart showing you what happened to the uh, blood sugar in these diabetics, uh, you can see it's, uh, there's a regression line there, and it started uh, over 200. And then at the end of just 10 days, it had uh, dropped, not to where we want it to be, but under 150. So there was a 75, 74 milligrams per deciliter, or approximately, uh, well, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know the SI units to give you. But uh, it had a significant drop in just two weeks. In fact, many people, when I show this to some of the uh, medical conferences, they ask, well, what medications were you using? What, did, what modern, wonderful medicine? And uh, actually, the two people that were in the group that were taking insulin, we had to uh, cut to, to drop their insulin because they were, the sugars were going too low. What we were doing, the marvelous treatment we were using was we were feeding them three meals a day, and we were teaching them, and we were exercising we were going on uh, exercise and walks. But you know, anytime I talk about lifestyle medicine, always someone, at least one or two in the group will say, yes, but I've just got bad genes. You know, my mother had this. Her mother had it. As far back as we know, it's in the family. So I've inherited it. Do you know that we don't only inherit genes? We inherit lifestyles. We inherit a taste for certain foods or certain kinds of activities. Um, If there's any gentlemen in the room that are married, um, or uh, their wives, I actually want to say, if there's any woman in the room who's married, uh, she probably has had the experience of her husband saying, I want you to learn to fix the dish that my mom used to make. It's not uncommon for, for us to want to have the same foods that we grew up with. And those foods, as you're going to learn, have very powerful effects. The January 2010 issue of Time Magazine had a special issue that was all about why your DNA isn't your destiny. And what it was talking about was the new science of epigenetics. And the epigenetics reveals that the choices we make can change our genes and those of our kids as well. So that's a pretty exciting piece of information, and I think you'll be uh, happy to know as we, as we finish this talk. It's take me, this is going to take us about 15, 20 minutes. Now, it starts with Watson and Crick, who won the Nobel, Peace, uh, the Nobel Prize, not Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, as the molecule of inheritance. And uh, they received, actually, they, they discovered that in the 50s. They received the Nobel 
Prize in 1962. Then only about a decade ago, the next major step happened, and that was about uh, the year 2000. The Human Genome Project finished sequencing the three billion base pairs in the human genome. Three billion, about 30,000 genes. And so with that, we found that there were millions of variations. Now, some of those variations can cause disease. Sickle cell disease is caused by just one variation uh, in, the, in the sugar, uh, the, the DNA molecule. But most of them cause no, no problem at all. They are simply normal variants. Uh, and this is how we actually can do a DNA test. If we were to do a DNA test in here to discover who it was that had committed the crime, we would be able to tell each one of us in the room completely uh, accurately, it'd be easy. We would, without any uncertainty, we would know the difference of individuals in the room based on the DNA test. And that's how it's done by these DNA variations. Excuse me. Now, I don't know if you recognize these little creatures. I'm not even sure they have them here in Australia, but these are little hedgehogs. And I show that picture to, to uh, remind us a little biology before I'm, we go to the next slide. And that is, you know from high school biology that we all came from an ovum or an egg from mom's ovaries and a sperm from dad's uh, ovary, if we will, squirt them. And so from those two that joined and formed a single cell, we had 23 chromosomes. And that cell then divided and made two, and in the process duplicated the chromosomes, right? And so forth. And after nine months, if everything went right, we were born trillions of cells, all made from that first one, right? So here's my question for you. If every cell in your body has the same DNA and the same genes, how is it some of it makes an ear, some of it makes a toe, some of it makes a brain? Well, the answer is that, well, first, before I tell you the answer, you realize, right, that all the genes to make a liver is in my ear. All the, all the genes to make a brain. All the genes to make a left ear in my right ear. And I'm so glad that they're turned off. You know, it looked kind of strange. Two left ears, a liver sitting here. So, point is, most of the genes in every cell in our body are actually quiescent or turned off. They're inactive. And in fact, it's, the, it's the, cons, the orchestra, the concert of turning on and turning off genes that produce each one of uh, the organs in our body, make us what we are. Now, the, here's the point. We don't actually inherit DNA. We inherit chromosomes. And as chromosomes are made up of 50% DNA and the other 50% are the proteins. We call them chaperone proteins. Now, I mentioned to you that Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize for discovering that deoxyribonucleic acid was the molecule of inheritance, but in reality, that's not the only molecule of inheritance. Those who were thinking that proteins carried inheritable information turned out to be right. The proteins do, in fact, carry information that is transmitted, as I'm going to show you more. And so what happens is, we have to have something to turn on and turn off the genes, to be able to turn on the gene and to turn it off. Otherwise, all 30,000 genes would be active in all cells and we would have one am amorphous mass. Here we have a little uh, picture or a micrograph, uh, highly uh, magnified, of the cell nucleus. It's actually only about one micrometer in diameter. Inside that cell, there's this over three meters of DNA, if we were to put it end to end. So this, this chaperone proteins that are there with the DNA determine which genes are turned on and which ones are turned off. And you notice, it's, as the slide says, the most powerful influence we know so far for turning on and turning off genes is food, is our diet. In fact, a recent study was just published, um, I don't have the citation, but I did read the article, 
and it showed that they've, we've determined that the gene switch settings are changed within 20 minutes of exercise. You start exercising within 20 minutes, the gene switch settings are changing in the muscles in your body. I can't wait till we look and see how long it takes for those genes to switch settings to change from food. We don't have that study yet. So the genes are turned on and off by these environmental influences and both the genes, the DNA, and the switch settings that are in the protein molecules are inherited. So that when we are born, we have the switch settings uh, positioned by the influences exerted upon our parents or grandparents. Let me show you a little uh, study here that was done in the Goody Mouse. The Goody Mouse is a very expensive mouse because it has been genetically modified so that it has the genes for obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and so forth, so that we can study these diseases in a mouse model. And these, mi these mice are typically used to study drugs and other substances uh, to, to de uh, develop pharmaceuticals to treat these conditions. But about a decade ago at Duke University in, in North Carolina in the U.S., there was a study done with the agouti mouse. And what they wanted to do was they were testing the hypothesis that influences during pregnancy could change switch settings on the genes in the offspring. And so this uh, study was done. They fed this mother a special diet that was to methylate the DNA, to change the switch settings on the genes that had been engineered into it. And then they were going to see the results in the child, the offspring, the baby. When the baby was born, history was made in that the baby did not even resemble the mother who had the special genes to not only make her be obese, but to give her a special color of hair. I don't know what I did there. Uh, a special coat. But when DNA testing was done, this mouse, baby mouse, has the same genes that are in the mother, but they are quiescent. They, have in, they were successful in turning off those genes. In fact, the researchers uh, in their paper said that the effects of this special diet were still evident three to four generations later. And anyone who's read anything in the, in the Bible has recognized that expression. But think of that implications that this has. That for good or for bad, that the switch settings that we give to our children are, in fact, to some extent, under our control. Now, this seems fantastic when you first hear, but let me point out some very simple biological fact that will make it a lot easier for you to grasp. Do you realize that the ovum from which you came and I came was formed in my mother's ovary while she was in grandma's uterus? because the ovaries are populated in the female during the first few months of the pregnancy. So actually, I was in my grandmother's <coughs> womb, uh, in a sense. And so, that helps us understand, it's not as fantastic as it first sounds, to realize that the uh, lifestyle influences of my ancestors, in fact, do bear upon me. Now I want to turn my attention to a different animal. I want to talk about a rat study. This study was published in 2008 in the Journal of Neuroscience. And uh, you think, well, why, why would a feeding study be published in a <coughs> neuroscience journal? And you will see why in a minute. The implications of this study are absolutely amazing. They did was they took a pregnant uh, rat and they fed her a high-fat diet. This is, not, uh, this is a diet you could uh, achieve yourself down at the close-by fast food place if you wanted to. Uh, you would need to choose the high-fat foods, but they're readily available. And uh, so we're talking 45-50% uh, fat in our diet. And then they were able to trace the effect in the developing uh, offspring, the developing fetus, to discover that the, uh, a gene on chromosome 3 in the developing fetus was overexpressed. And the overexpression of this gene on chromosome 3 was resulting in neurogenesis, the production of neurons in excess 
quantity uh, than would normally be produced. So we're actually talking about this diet produced an anatomical difference in the brain of the developing fetus. Now these cells that were being produced, these neurons, are hormonally active cells. They took up their residence at the base of the brain. Uh, they migrated to the part of the brain where they belong. And at, after birth, during adolescence, the, the uh, cells were began, you know, their normal function, they began producing the hormones that produ uh, influenced the phenotype, uh, influenced the child. Boy, oh. So what we saw was an increase in blood lipids. Is that something that I'm doing when I, let me try to go back and then go forward and see if, okay, I won't, I'll, uh, I won't use my pointer. I'm not sure what I'm doing. That. So anyway, you'll notice that a higher blood fat a higher preference for, uh, for eating fat, uh, a, a higher body weight, uh, and early puberty, all of the things that we are actually seeing as a profile happening in young people around the globe as they adopt a more Western lifestyle. As they adopt a higher fat diet, a more processed food diet, we're seeing exactly those, those characteristics happening in young people. And it's not, uh, without, it's not without its ill effects. Now I want to turn from my last study I want to tell you about is in humans because we're not mice and we're not rats. Uh, so let's look at a human study. Might this actually also work in human beings or not? This was uh, published also in 2008 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and by Dr. Dean Ornish uh, and his team. Now Dr. Ornish is, at least in the U.S., fairly well known for his how to prevent heart disease. He has a low-fat vegetarian approach to uh, treating heart disease and it's been proven with angiographic evidence that they can re remove or reduce the blockages in the coronary arteries. So they used this basically the same lifestyle intervention, but this was in prostate cancer. This was men uh, who had prostate cancer and they did not get chemotherapy or radiation, but instead they got a lifestyle intervention treatment. Some people might uh, uh, question whether they were treated since they didn't, all they did was change their, their food and their exercise. Uh, but it, uh, you'll see it was in fact very effective treatment. They didn't, uh, so they received this lifestyle intervention program. Um, it, they donated serial biopsies. So they took a biopsy with a needle of the prostate uh, cells that were cancer. Put the needle into the cells and got a specimen, if you will, of the cancer cells. And then after three months, they did the same thing. Took another biopsy of the cells. So we actually have in this study where we are looking at the actual cancer cells and the change in the cancer cells during this three-month intervention. And from that, as you can see, I hope, yes, that there were nanogram quantities, small quantities of messenger RNA that were able to be taken and purified from those cells. Now, why would messenger RNA be useful to us? Well, if you again back to your biology, you know that messenger RNA is used to transcribe from the DNA in the, in the nucleus of the cell, and then the messenger RNA goes out to the cytoplasm where the ribosome attach and we produce the protein. So, so in essence, the messenger RNA is the is a molecule that tells us which genes are being transcribed. And the half-life of messenger RNA is fairly short. So in the, the, there was, it's a, in hours to days. And so this tells us one way of telling which genes are being transcribed or not. The intervention itself was pretty straightforward. Uh, looking at the dietary modification, it was a low fat, 10% of energy from fat, whole food, plant-based diet. It was uh, supplemented with soy protein and and the fish oil and vitamin E, you can see. And all the food and all the things were provided so the individuals could, could comply with this program for the three months. Now, this is how we look at the changes in gene expression. It's, a, it's called a heat map. Uh, and basically on the left-hand side, um, you can see pre-intervention, the left-hand side of both images. And on the right, you see post-intervention. And what you're basically looking at here is there's one column in each uh, side of the chart for each person. So there's 30 men uh, in the columns. And then the rows are the, are the different genes. 
And so the more messenger RNA that is present in this man's sample for that particular gene, uh, the darker the color. So what it boils down to is that dark color indicates higher gene production, uh, transcription, and a light color is less. And so that makes it easy to just get a global picture here. I would think all of us can say that, yes, we see more light, light squares on the right-hand side than on the left. In fact, the study showed that over 400 genes, distinctive genes, associated and known to be associated with cancer production were turned down, decreased in the transcription rate in these prostate cells, which were cancerous. There was about, an, uh, they also found about 40 or 50 genes known to be associated with cancer prevention or fighting cancer that had been turned up uh, and were being transcribed in greater quantity in three months with a lifestyle change. Dr. Jurdle is the one from Duke that did the study on the agouti mouse. So he's one of the pioneers in epigenetics, one of the uh, fathers of this field. And I love this quote from him. Uh, he says, epigenetics is proving we have some responsibility for the integrity of our genome. Before, before under epigenetics, genes predetermined outcomes. But now everything we do, everything we eat, everything we smoke, can affect our gene expression and that of future generations. And then he says, epigenetics introduces the concept of what? Of free will into our idea of genetics. You know, we, have gotten, we had gotten too uh, far into the idea that our DNA was our fate. There's nothing you can do about it. I couldn't choose my parents. But what we're understanding is that actually, while it's true, that our parents' lifestyle can affect the gene switch settings we're born with, we can change those settings by our choices also. Dr. Feinberg at Johns Hopkins University in the U.S. is another pioneer in this field for human. Uh, and here's what he uh, wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association. He says, epigenetics is at the epicenter of modern medicine. And it helps explain the relationship between an individual's genetic background the environment, aging, and disease. And that's why, we're ex uh, why it's so exciting is this helps us. We, have now, we now understand that we have found the common mechanism, if you will, by which all of those things act. The genes act through the epigenome because the epigenome turns them on and off. The, the environment can affect the epigenetic switches, turning it on and off. Age, over a period of time, age changes those switch settings, and disease certainly does as well. So it's exciting to... So what this really boils down to is changing your diet and lifestyle changes your epigenome. We've seen that in three specific studies already. Change the epigenome, and that changes gene expression, right? Because that's what the epigenome does, is it controls gene expression. Change gene expression... Well, that changes you, literally. And isn't it interesting? Think about it just for a moment philosophically now. Isn't it interesting to realize that your choice and your actions can change you in a, at an organic cellular level? It's, and to me, I consider that very exciting. Some people get very discouraged by that. I guess it depends on which way you're changing your habits. But it's true that it raises the bar on how important it is the choices we make for our, our lifestyle. If we look at health as the outcome that we're interested in, most of us are interested in optimal health, we find that DNA sequence probably is about 10% of the determinant of, the, of health. And medical care, good medical care at the proper time, probably can add another 10% to that. And the environment, things we have no control over is what I mean there, uh, is talking about global warming. I mean, we as a collective, as a population, we may have something to do about it. But basically, individually, there's, there's, I cannot change that. Of course, I realize as I'm saying that as an illustration. You need to think globally and act locally. So I'm not saying you shouldn't 
do your part to, but my point is it's out of our control individually. But the thing that we do have control over, 70% of the outcome determinant of our health is lifestyle, lifestyle choices. Well, that's just, that's good. Uh, it may be a good time to, to a break because I want to switch to the other s- slides. Um, let me just make, see what this next. Yes. So I'm going to now talk about the two hearts in the human body. It's not going to be at 2 o'clock, though. It's going to be at...